So first question uh, we have from Sean Walsh, uh, and that is, will the oncoming autumn and winter favour Ukrainian forces as it did at the start of the war when uh, Russian tanks were hampered by that soft, muddy ground? Mm. It plays both ways. Uh, the, the rainy season in Ukraine is summer and autumn, so they're coming into that really wet season now, or partly in it, and that won't help uh, Russian armoured vehicles. When it gets very cold, armoured vehicles can use the hard ground, but there's that period in between when it's more difficult. Weather never plays it all one way. Generally speaking, cold winters or difficult winters play better for the defenders than the attackers. If you're trying to attack, you've got to move around, you've got to keep moving, you've got to keep things agile, whereas if you're defending, you've just got to stay where you are. So uh, cold winters, difficult winters are miserable for everybody, but they're more miserable for the attackers than the defenders. Are, are the Russians now the defenders? They are. Um, in the, they're, they're not moving uh, in the Donbass. They look as if they're digging in in the Donbass for the winter, and they are now defending in Kherson in the south, and the Ukrainians are attacking. So the Ukrainians will want to get their attack over. They want, to, they want a success before the rain gets to wet, before the ground gets to wet, and before the cold weather starts in November, December. And for that reason, they're on a bit of a timetable now. They've got to prove to the West and themselves that they can attack successfully, more than village by village, a wide area attack to put the Russians on the back foot. And is it fair to say that the last month has been a little bit of a stalemate? And has the weather got anything to do with that? Sort of too favourable, the weather almost? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a stalemate. People say stalemate. I mean, not many arrows on the map have appeared, but there's quite a lot going on. And so, yeah, the weather's got something to do with it. I think the, the Russians have decided that they can't mount any more big offensives before the winter, which means in the spring. And they now look as if they're, they're taking a breath for probably a big offensive in the spring. The Ukrainians are using this window in the weather before it starts to get cold and very difficult, uh, I think, to gain what they can in the southwest. Jackie asks, um, as it's six months since Russia invaded and uh, clearly not going Putin's way so far, how likely is it that uh, he could resort to a nuclear attack? Yeah, I mean, this always comes up, and it's a, it's a fair question. Um, the, the point is that a nuclear attack, even a tactical nuclear weapon, which, you know, would cover, so two or three kilometres with real destruction, can only be used against concentrated troops. And the Ukrainians are not concentrated. They, they are, they're fairly dispersed. It's only troop... Uh, concentrations that offer a valuable target, even for very small nuclear weapons. And, of course, bigger nuclear weapons, to use a nuke uh, against you know, a city like Sumy or Chernihiv as a, as a punishment to the Ukrainians, would put Putin so completely on the wrong side of history that even the Chinese, I think, would, would, would drop him if that were the case. So I think we're, we are a long way from the use of nuclear weapons. But I have... I mean, just today, a former British ambassador has said... Um, on Twitter, he said, look, if all else fails for Russia and if Putin is faced with a really awful defeat, you cannot rule it out. And I take his, his line seriously. And, and are there any other weapons that they have in their arsenal that are somewhere in between what they've used so far and the, the, the sort of targeted nuclear yeah. weapon that they could still bring out? Yes, I mean, hypersonic weapons, the uh, MOABs, they're called, the, the, uh, uh, um, the Americans call them the mother of all bombs, a massive ordnance uh, airburst. So they've got big weapons that do as much damage as a small nuclear weapon. And we've seen some of those, these sort of earthquake bombs, they could be used. And those are, are thermobaric bombs, which create massive overpressure. They're very, very destructive. Again, they can only usefully be used against concentration of forces. We may see that, we may see it, um, but not this year. We might see it if the Russians come, come under real pressure to losing real territory that matters to them, maybe after Christmas. Uh, in terms of uh, other questions, Elizabeth asks, are there any truth to the rumours about Putin's health? That was a big rumour a few months ago. It's yeah. kind of gone away. Yes. I, I, he's said to have pan pancreatic cancer and all sorts of things. He moves around with doctors. He, 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 he doesn't spend very long without going to consult his doctors. But personally, I think he's just a hypochondriac. Um, and he's been rumoured for many years to hit the Botox very hard indeed. So my, my theory is always that he'll die of Botox. Uh, but th there's no real evidence that this man is ill. And even if he were, and people think, well, if he's ill, he's on a timetable to do something before he dies. I don't think it's like that. He's on a timetable before this whole thing falls apart on him. And for that, he's maybe got a year or 18 months before this war that he cannot win at the moment actually turns uh, in on itself within the Kremlin. So he's on a timetable anyway, health or no. Um, Ahmed asks uh, if you see Belarus joining the war at any point. No. Uh, Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, has been very, very careful. He's, he's allowed Belarus territory to be used, 
but he's, he himself is under real pressure domestically. I mean, the war is not popular in Belarus, and he's got a lot of opposition against him, which nearly deposed him just over a year ago, and he's, he's kept out of it, as have many of the... Uh, Russia's allies. I mean, you look at the, um, cen the um, uh, Central Treaty Security Organization, which includes Kazakhstan and Armenia and Tajikistan. None of them, none of them have actually helped the Russians out. And in Kazakhstan's case, uh, President Tokirev of Kazakhstan, I mean, Putin saved his bacon last year when there were internal um, uh, riots, and Putin sent in the paratroopers to suppress them. So Tokirev owes him. But even they have not actually joined in. I think Putin must be spitting blood and feathers about the failure of his allies to actually send troops. So Lukashenko, no. Um, he might join in. If the Russians were clearly winning in the final stage of the war, he might then rush into it in order to show how much solidarity he feels. But his position is so delicate himself... He won't take. He won't step over the border at the moment. It's such an interesting question. We're going to come to China later on in the hour. But but outside of China, what, what about the other allies? Might he have expected a little? Maybe not an ally, but what about Turkey? Could they have been more neutral than they've been? Well, Are he less supportive of yeah, the West position. Gosh, I mean, Turkey's playing it both ways because they're sending Bayraktar drones to Ukraine, which are having a big effect on the war. At the same time, they're helping Putin diplomatically because they won't implement sanctions, uh, Western sanctions. And so um, Erdogan of Turkey is really trying to play. Uh, both sides to the middle, and whether he can keep on doing that is a question. The um, other Russian backers are the basket cases. So he's got backing from Syria, he's got backing from some of African leaders where the Russians are involved, he's got a little bit of backing in North Africa from Haftar in, I mean, a breakaway group in Libya uh, who's sitting in Benghazi. I mean, basically, they, they've, they've, they've got the, some of the dregs of the Middle East and Africa in terms of mercenary forces who are being paid quite handsomely by, handsomely by the Russians to join the Wagner group and go to Ukraine. They are vicious, they are not without use, but they can't fit into a general combined arms effort. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can massacre people and they can take ground that's already been pounded by artillery, but they're not a, a, lo a whole lot of use otherwise. Let's uh, switch focus and talk about one of Ukraine's biggest allies and supporters, and, and that is Boris Johnson. How, how significant... Was it that he made that, that trip to there? It's a question uh, from, from Jack. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it took, it took me by surprise, certainly, that he suddenly turned up. And I saw Melinda Simmons right by his side mm -hmm. uh, in that first clip that we saw, who's the British ambassador, very good British ambassador in Kiev. And I thought, well, good for you, because this must be a nightmare, getting a prime minister into Kiev on a day when the missiles might have been raining down. That must have been a security problem of high importance but they they did it and it was a it was a sort of diplomatic coup which will probably annoy a lot of other european leaders but the message he was taking was that you know we are prepared to take you know some degree of personal risk to come and support you and i'm sure the message was that whatever happens in terms of you know whichever leader becomes uh, prime minister, whichever the Tory leaders becomes prime minister in a couple of weeks' time, they will be no less committed than I am. I'm sure that was the message today. And, and in terms uh, of the continuity aspect of this, is it important that the MOD is still led by the same person in Ben Wallace, as it appears might be the case, whoever yeah. wins? Or, or does that not really make a difference, as long as the general gist from the top is, is still strong? Well, the, yeah, I think the gist from the top will be consistent. I mean, I, th I think Ben Wallace probably... My, my guess is he will remain Minister of Defence, and I think he wants to. The whole of that MOD team, you know, they ne when everyone else was leaving the government, the MOD team just kept their heads down and carried on doing their mm -hmm. job. When, when the government was collapsing everywhere, they didn't. And I think they take some pride in that, because they think, look, we've got a more important job to do than worry too much about domestic politics. And the MOD is absolutely committed to training. I mean, there's this sort of quarterly, every 100 or 120 days, they're getting more people through. And so they are committed to that. They're committed to more Training weapons. Ukrainian... Training forces. Ukrainian forces, yeah. Um, the, the issue is how much more can we give... Um, that they need, um, because we've run down most of our own stocks. And this Ukrainian war is teaching us, uh, if, we, if, if we needed to be taught, that we could lose most of the British army in an afternoon um, if we were fighting at this level of intensity, simply because of the lack of backup and sustainability. We're on very, very thin margins. And so, you know, we've given so much of our anti-tank stuff away. Um, we can't give too many of our vehicles away because we've barely got enough for ourselves. We have got to gear up like a lot of Western countries, to rearm a bit in order to give material to Ukraine and make ourselves a bit safer. And that message is out there loud and clear, but no politician has yet picked it up. It's amazing to hear you, you frame the scale of that. In fact, Alan also asked, will the MOD be ramping up military recruitment in the face of an aggressive Russian state, which I guess is 
in terms of personnel, um, yeah. but, but we need to replenish our supplies in general. We do. And the, the numbers um, are at a, a historic low. I mean, the army was 82,000. It's, it's due to go down to 72,500 in the integrated review, which is a... Is whatever, whatever is the right number for the army, it's not 72,500. It can either be lower than that or a good deal higher than that, mm. depending on what you, want, what you want the army to do. And the army itself has made it very clear, and Ben Wallace has made it clear, that the, the forces are too small that they need to be expanded. But he's getting no traction at the moment, not much from Downing Street, even with Boris in charge, and he's not getting any traction yet with Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, and we'll see whoever becomes Prime Minister how that goes. But nobody in the defence business, I mean, the analytical community that I'm a part of, none of us think that British defence at the moment is adequate to the... not only to the tasks it sets itself, but to the tasks it will be called upon in the next five years, partly because of the Ukraine war. Wow, uh, a sobering thought. Michael, thank you so much for that. That's just the, the first uh, segment of our special hour Q&A. We're just getting started here. We'll be back after the break and specifically talking uh, about current ongoing situations like the uh, nuclear power plant, like Crimea. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back on Sky News tonight in a couple of minutes. I'm Becky Johnson, a Sky News correspondent, part of the team based here in the Midlands. Allegations of exploitation in Leicester's clothing factories aren't new. In fact, it's been an open secret in this city for years. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. We're getting more and more stabbing, and essentially I think it's more and more younger children. As a team, we're not really surprised by anything these days. So there's reports of uh, a male who's been stabbed repeatedly in the leg. Here in the diverse industrial heart of England, we hear from people who have real stories to tell. <laughs> Parents are going to complain like this, and schools had better get ready for it. These protests are being organised primarily by people who aren't parents at the school. So some patients aren't going to survive this. We have to be prepared that patients will die from, from this illness. Staff here are currently identifying wards that could be turned into areas where patients with COVID-19 could be isolated. The River Severn is still rising and people here in Ironbridge have been told it could go up by another metre before it starts to go back down. It's going to be a long, slow process of putting it back together. Isn't it? We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. I'm Yvan Bourgnon, I'm a sailor. I spent uh, half time of my life on, on, the, on the sea. We have a factory who can convert this plastic to energy. And so after, at the end, we can minimize the footprint carbon of the boat. Welcome back. Uh, this is a special Sky News Tonight Q&A on six months of war in Ukraine. Uh, with us uh, still is our defence analyst, uh, Michael Clark, who's answering your questions. Uh, in this uh, segment of the show, we're going to focus on some more local uh, ongoing uh, situations. Uh, and let's start with this power plant in, in Zaporizhia, the nuclear power plant. Realistically, what, what is the solution here that is possible that, that people might agree to? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the solution would be to have an IAEA team, International Atomic Energy Authority team, who are a UN team, um, go into the plant and look after it. 
maybe with Ukrainian workers who are used to it, and that all the military, say, withdraws to five kilometres all the way around it. But there's no question that the Russians have been using the plant to store munitions and to use it as a base. I've got direct evidence of that. I've seen it myself. I haven't seen direct evidence that they're firing out of the plant. They're using... They've got artillery firing from the plant. They're accused of it. I haven't actually seen that evidence. But the Russians are certainly using the plant as a kind of safe haven. So the, the answer would be for them to agree, and the Ukrainians to agree, which I'm sure they would, to a sort of a five-kilometre five exclusion zone and let the international community be responsible for keeping the plant going. That would be the answer. Uh, but like the grain shipments, it might be a long process of negotiation with the Russians. My follow-up on, on that, I have to say, Michael, is, I mean, ideal if, if we could yeah. get there, but can we really blame the Russians who are at war yeah. for storing weapons there? It's rather a clever ploy because if... Ukraine attacks, it's, it's, well, yep. it's unlikely that Ukraine attacks because of it. Yes, I, I, it is. I mean, in warfare, people will tend to do that. But, I mean, the solution is to exclude this area from, from the war because it's an international problem. And the problem is not the reactors, incidentally. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're the reactors. They're all encased in concrete. They will withstand bombs, they'll withstand rockets, they'll withstand an aircraft crashing into them. They're designed for that. The issue is the turbine hall. The issue is the coolant system. And that's far less secure in all nuclear plants. And so if the coolant is actually turned off or, or interfered with, then the reactors will go critical. That's what happened at Fukushima. It's what happened in a different mm -hmm. way at, um, uh, early on in Chernobyl. Um, so it's, it's the main problem is not the reactors. It's the way the reactors are maintained that's the, the problem. Realistically, Russia unlikely to agree to anything like that? Or... No, yeah, I, I don't think they will. I mean, I, I think they'll just keep playing this issue along and mm -hmm. saying that uh, they're not using it for any nefarious purposes, they're doing their best to keep it going, and the Ukrainians should stop attacking it. Um, let's move on to, to Cry Crimea and, and how important, Condor asks this, uh, how important is Crimea to both the Russians and the, the Ukrainians? Um, very. Um, it, I mean, it's very important to the Russians because Crimea is regarded, was regarded as an intrinsic part of the Soviet Union. It was only given to Ukraine in 1954 by Khrushchev. Uh, it was given to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic to administer in 1954. And the Russians in the 19th century, when they took it over by conquest, had basically got rid of all the Tartars. They, they ethnically cleansed Ukraine of the Tartars, the Cossacks who were based there, who, 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 for whom it was their homeland. And so it is effectively, because it's been colonised over more than a century, it's more or less 100% or 90-odd percent Russian, with some Tartar minorities who don't do very well. And importantly, of course, there's Sevastopol. Um, and the base at Sevastopol is an incredibly important naval base for Russia, partly because it shows that Russia's got the ability to project power. That is the base from which the Black Sea fleet operates. It, they project power, not, in the, not only in the Black Sea, but throughout the Mediterranean. So it matters to the Russians. If they were to lose Crimea, which, which legally they should, because it's Ukrainian territory and was recognised as Ukrainian in 1991 and 1992, 30-odd years ago, when Ukraine became an independent state, but if they did lose it, they would regard that as intrinsically losing a piece of Russia. They'd be wrong to think that, but it's what they would think. Does Ukraine have the capability to take it back? No. I mean, not for some time. Um, the Ukrainians, they claim that they will, and they have to say that. Of course they do. Um, but they will fight... I mean, if, they, if there is a negotiated end to this crisis, sometime, say, next year or late next year, whatever, the great bargaining chip the Ukrainians will have will be to say, look, we will, we will have back all the territory you took from us, plus the Donbass, which is always Ukrainian, but we'll leave the status of Crimea as it is. I mean, that, and they're not going to offer that now, but when they, if they're in a more dominant position in negotiations, if they ever get to that point, then that would be the big offer. But they can't say that now. They have to say that Crimea is Ukrainian, which legally it is, and that they will fight for it. But their chances of, of invading it successfully and taking it is very, very low. Despite that, Rich asks why Ukraine taking so long to blow up the Crimean bridge that was built by Russia. Oh, the Kerch Strait, yeah, yeah. Yes, but I mean, this, is the, this is the strait between Russia proper, proper, you know, Russia itself, and that little tip of Crimea, right to the east of Crimea. And it, there used to be a ferry there um, until uh, 2014. That's all it was, just a ferry. And the Russians built this enormous bridge. And it is the, the Kirsch Bridge now, and that is the only reliable land link between Russia and, and Crimea that doesn't run through Ukrainian territory further north. Mm -hmm. um, the Ukrainians would, I think, they're, they're not sure they want to target it. 
actually, because it would be a targeted... It would be targeting something that leads into Russia, and I think the Russians would take that very badly. But also, the Russians are defending it ferociously. They've got lots of air defence there, and they've got, they've got there this enormous ship, which they claim is a cruise ship, which just happens to sit there. And this cruise ship has got about eight enormous dishes on the top, enormous radar dishes. And this is a, a, a reflective radar ship, which is there to actually um, confuse any incoming missiles. And this ship has been sitting there for weeks, and the Russians can say, it's a cruise ship. Well, they must have some fabulous TV on that cruise ship because <laughs> it's nothing but, but radar dishes on the top. Well, they've probably got Sky. They must right. have Sky TV. They're tuning in to, to us right now. Um, or perhaps Sky Atlantic watching Game of Thrones. But uh, either way, let's, let's move on. So what's the likelihood that, that Russia will, uh, if they take Odessa, well, A, take Odessa, and B, move on to Moldova, potentially, uh, after that. That's a question from, from... Yeah, they can't do that um, for a long time to come. They've tried. That's what they wanted to do. But, I mean, they didn't take Mikolaev. And they've been pushed back from Mikolaev. And Mikolaev is 85 uh, miles away from Odessa, and Odessa's 30 miles away from the Moldovan border. So they're more than 100 miles away from the border with Moldova. And they're going backwards in that region, not forwards. Um, Odessa is, I mean, it can still be bombed, it can still be attacked, but remember Odessa and ports around it like uh, um, uh, Chernomorsk are being used for this grain deal which is now taking place. So the Russians don't want to bomb Odessa, although they have done and they claim they might, and Chernomorsk, places like that. Uh, for now, they're pretty safe because the Russian troops can't get there. Their maritime forces in the Black Sea that looked as if they were ready to invade can't because they've lost too many of those forces. They're just too far away, and the grain deals gives Odessa some degree of international. The Russians protection. sort of honouring that grain deal. Uh, for the most part? Only to a degree, they're, they're getting about a million tons a month out, but they should be getting five million tons a month out. So ships are leaving, but not in the numbers that they need. They need about 400, 450 trips to get the 20-odd million tonnes out that is, is backed up there, and they've only had a couple of dozen so far. Um, so, I mean, I'm expecting the Russians to start to interfere with that, to start to play games with it, but so far they haven't, but the, the extent has been small so far. Quick question from Alice uh, on events of this past week. Could, could the killing of Daria Dugina be linked to a Russian resistance and then conveniently blamed on Ukraine afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the Ukrainians had nothing to do with this. I mean, there's no advantage to them. There's everything to, to lose by this sort of an assassination in Moscow. And why would they try and assassinate, you know, somebody who was a nobody, to be honest? I mean, she just had crazy views. And she was the daughter of Alexander Dugin, who also has crazy views, but had no influence, despite what people say, with Putin. Uh, he had had influence, but he'd never met Putin, never been in government. Um, so oh, this He's never a... met Putin? No. No, I mean, he was he was a bit influential in 19, in 2014, and his work it, that he wrote, he wrote on civilizations about the Russian sort of mission for the world was circulated around government. You know the way the Americans do; they find find a text and tell everybody to read it. So he had a guru status, but he's basically a self publicist. And that, I, so I, I really don't believe we, we don't know, but I really don't believe that the Ukrainians had much anything to do with that. Um, the um, uh, Ilya Pomerenkov, uh, who said, I think, yeah, day before yesterday, he said, oh, it's the um, uh, National Republican Army. Nobody had ever heard of them before. But this NRA, he said, are responsible for bombing some of the recruitment offices in Russia and they're, they're responsible for some violent um, acts in Russia against the war. Well, maybe, maybe. But it's just as likely to have been a sort of a, a mafia hit or something like that. Or it might be a false flag attack. Uh, in the sense that this is because, if, I mean, last night I was looking at some of the translated versions on Rossiya One, the, uh, the the Russian main line news channel, and they were saying, I mean, all these characters stand around every night, and they said all this has been created by Ukraine, Estonia, and Britain, and they 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 blame Britain in particular, and they say it's British intelligence is behind this, and British intelligence is trying to destabilise Europe, and Bellingcat, the the investigative journalist, group, they're they're behind it as well, and the Daily Mail, they mentioned the Daily Mail. Um, they said, all these things are written in the Daily Mail. They pay us the compliment, <laughs> but in a strange way of believing that we're behind everything. Um, and so there is, there's a real sort of anti-Britishness mm -hmm. every night, more or less, that I have a look at it, uh, on Russia One and uh, NTV TV, some of their mainline channels, which are all state-sponsored channels. They're all mouthpieces of the Kremlin. Um, but, I mean, the, the Dugin issue, I think, will run, and it may well be that it's certainly been whipped up in Russia mm -hmm. as justification for mobilisation. And that mobilisation is against Ukraine, but against Ukraine's backers, particularly the British. Very interesting. Uh, as always, uh, Michael, thank you for that segment. Uh, much more sort of come on the special Q&A. Uh, next segment, we'll be talking about how this war might possibly end and where it goes next. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back uh, to this uh, special Sky News tonight Q&A on six months of the war in Ukraine. With uh, us uh, is, of course, defence analyst Michael Clark, who's answering your questions. On to a topic uh, that we've called end of war possibilities. So you, you've got to get your predictive hat on here, Michael. So, so first question from Neil. Um, without Western aid, would the Ukrainians be able to hold up Russian advances? No. Simple as that. Um, I mean, they've got, they've got the manpower because Ukraine say that they're, they're training 700,000 people with a million in mind, and I think that's plausible because it's a country of 44 million people and they're fighting for their lives. So they've certainly got the manpower and they've got the, they've got the moral component and they're desperate and they will train and they'll do whatever needs to be done and they'll be very brave. But in terms of equipment, they, they don't have enough of everything that they need and they don't have the offensive equipment, which they can only get from us or from the West, for these uh, long-range strikes, for accurate artillery, for missiles, and for the intelligence, counter-battery radars, all the sort of things that make these weapons effective. They depend on us. If, if the West tomorrow withdrew all of its support, then Ukraine would be wrapped up militarily within a couple of months, I would guess. Well, and, and how much more is coming that they haven't had yet? I mean, $3 billion announced from the US, but, yeah. but in terms of the training and expertise they've needed to maximise this Western aid, are they now up to speed on that, or could they get a lot better in the coming months? Well, that's a good question. Um, one thing, that they're not getting enough tanks and they're not getting enough armoured personnel carriers, the armoured vehicles that they need for offensive operations. They're getting lots of, of um, handheld weapons, anti-tank weapons, light weapons, weapons for defence. But to go on the offensive, which they're trying to do in Kirshen, they need the heavy metal. And they've had a fair bit of that, but not enough. And they certainly don't have enough air power, because to go on the offensive, you've got to integrate ground and air power in a very effective, brutal way. They're not getting enough of that either. We're, we're, we're day 181 now. I mean, when you and I were talking on days 20 and yes. back, back then, one of the things we were saying was if the West gave anything other than defensive weapons, yeah. then Russia would, would think that was a NATO involvement in the war and could... Uh, put strikes on Europe. I mean, is that how Russia's still thinking, or are we now sneaking in we've offensive crossed, weapons? We've crossed a series of thresholds. As the, as the, as the war has gone on, as Russia's behaviour has, has become exposed, I mean, this brutality, the war crimes and so on, that, that has actually strengthened the consensus in the West. And one by one, these thresholds have been crossed. So, yes, we'll give them long-range artillery. Yes, we'll give them multiple launch rocket systems. We won't yet give them the aircraft that they would really like, the F-16, but who knows? Um, I mean, but they've had, you know, MiG-29s from the stocks in Eastern Europe and so on. Uh, one by one, Western thresholds are being crossed by us as we see the need that Ukrainians have to actually fight this war efficiently. And there's no, there's no getting away from it. The Ukrainian, you know, we are fighting a war against Russia via Ukraine. And it's, it's, it's now become an industrial war a war in, in the industrial age, and it will be one, or the side that will prevail, is the side that can mobilise resources most efficiently and apply them. And if we don't mobilise the resources for Ukraine, then we will not prevail. If Russia doesn't mobilise its resources, it will not prevail. Let's take the F-16, then, as, a, as an example. What, what's stopping that being given to them at the moment? Is it a collective fear from the West of how Russia would respond, or is it individual nations? Are the UK and the US already ready to give that, or what? Yeah, it's, it's an American fear that that would be maybe a step too far, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, you know, I mean, a completely new aircraft. F-16s are very good, everybody would like them. Um, Turkey wants them, they want the newest version and so on. But pilots have got to be trained, so you can't just give them 30 or 40 F-16s and, and hope that they will make a difference. So it, it would take some time, and the Russians would certainly, if they saw NATO aircraft flying over Ukraine attacking their forces, they would then think that they had some justification for saying, look, we are being attacked by NATO. Just because they're U Ukrainian pilots in the cockpit doesn't mean to say we're not being attacked by NATO. So that would be a biggish threshold, but I wouldn't rule it out because at some point we've got to decide how much are we prepared to back Ukraine next year after Christmas um, to prevail in this war. We talk about winning the war, we mean prevailing to throw back this crazy imperialist adventure that Putin has launched. That's what winning will mean, not, not winning the war by, you know, wrecking Russia. That's not, not, not on the cards. Winning the war by prevailing and throwing back certainly the gains that have been made since the 24th of February. Let's uh, touch on that Russian side then. So how long can, can Russia sustain 
the war, considering how many resources they have left? That's well, a question from Rob. It's patchy. I mean, the thing they've got most of is artillery. They've got artillery tubes and they've got artillery shells. It's estimated they've got about 20 million shells in store, some going back many, many years. So whether they still work or not, we don't know. They can ma manufacture about a million and a half a year because they're not hard to manufacture. But even on, on present usage rates, if they keep on fighting the way they are now, using these you know, thousands of shells at a time, they're using as many shells now as the Wehrmacht used uh, in the 1943-44 in Russia. I mean, this has got sec it's become Second World War proportions in terms of artillery. If, if those usage rates, they can probably only carry on for two years, and that's with artillery. If we look at tanks and armoured personnel carriers, then it's less than that because they just don't have the, the stocks that are still usable. Uh, and most important of all, the Russians don't have the manpower at the moment. So all this means that if the Russians carry on as they are now, they can, they can fight into next year and maybe the year afterwards, but they will do worse and worse if they do that until, unless or until, they mobilise efficiently. At the moment, they're going through a sort of crypto mobilisation. They're, they're not saying they're mobilising, but they're trying to mobilise in all sorts of ways. It's not really working. At some point, and that's why the, um, uh, these false flag attacks uh, may be important, of the assassinations of uh, Dugina and so on, is that if they go for full mobilisation, then, the, the, then everything changes. And then they will gear up uh, their industry, they'll move their civilian industry into war production, and then they could go on for many, many years. Um, Ricky asks, what are the chances of Putin being ousted domestically? Um, we don't know. I mean, I think personally, I think Putin is finished because he's in a complete blind alley. There's a stupid war and there's no way out of it for him other than some sort of humiliation and defeat. Um, I really don't believe there's a sensible way out. Um, but uh, popular opinion is not going to oust him because Russia is more repressive now or as repressive as it was during Stalin's uh, later days. Um, and is that repressive now? Yeah, it really oh. is. Um, I, I mean, the... Uh, you know, the, 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 the Ex-editor talking about to say that the invasion is a war is is it looks as if it will get somebody five years in prison. There are three and a half thousand cases of people who are being accused of disrespecting the military, and that carries a prison term of five years. Um, and journalists now, if they don't leave Russia, they simply can't say the word war. Mm -hmm. Five years in prison if you do. It's very very repressive. So th there's no easy way for um, the public who are getting. Dis disenchanted with this, for you know, there are all sorts of indications of, of that, that they can't really express it. If Putin is removed, it'll be by the elite around him. It'll be because the oligarchs turn on him because they, they see that Russia's in such a blind alley and it really begins to affect them. Uh, and so it could happen quickly or it could happen in two or three years' time. The longer it, it, it is before it happens, the more Russia will be either on its knees or severely disadvantaged by the economic mess that it's getting itself into. And, and if he was removed any which way, who takes over? Could it be a worse <laughs> outcome? Yes. It won't be a nice person. Um, I mean, it will be a man, it won't be a woman. Um, and Petrushev is often thought to be a successor who's more extreme, at least in his views, than Putin. Whether he's as competent or not, we don't know. Petrushev is his national security advisor. Um, it could be um, Kiryenko, who is his uh, deputy chief of staff, who's also a tough guy. Could be Lavrov, uh, who's gone over to the, the foreign minister, who's gone over to the dark side in recent years and is a very strange man now. Or um, Shogu, the defence minister, who everyone thought was on a death's door a few months ago, doesn't seem to be. He too has a Putin view. It won't be somebody like Medvedev or uh, Volodin. Uh, these people are, are, are not. They're, they're on. They're not on the way up. But uh, Petrushev, um, Kiryenko, Lavrov, Shogu, they're all on the way up within the Putin circle. So if there were a coup then my, at the moment you'd say, well, probably one of those four, unless somebody emerges from the woodwork that we're not really aware of at the moment. Um, in terms of the West's involvement, what are the chances at this stage, kind of going back to, to the earlier part of mm. this section of the conversation, of full Western engagement in a, in a really terrifying way, in a World War III type way? Yeah, I, I don't worry too much about the World War III uh, ideas. Um, I mean, there's lots of books written over the last 30 years about World War III, and they're all full of... There's a chapter on the Middle East, chapter on Africa, chapter on Russia, chapter on uh, the Taiwan Straits. Mm -hmm. And they're all plausible, but the thing that they lack is what would unite them into a world war. I mean, the, you know, the first world war was the, the Seven Years' War, um, 1756 to 63, and that was united by the empires of Britain and France. The First World War, 20th century, was united again by the empires of Germany on the one hand, Austria-Hungary, Russia and Britain and France on the other. 
The Second World War was united by ideology. It united a series of disparate conflicts that all seemed to become world war. That's not the case now. We can think of lots of conflicts over China and Taiwan, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in, in Russia, um, in, in other parts, in Africa, East Africa, West Africa. There's nothing that unites them and there's no countries that unite them all. And so the idea that this could, could as it were, escalate to World War III just, is not plausible to me. But could it become more serious? Yes, it could. Um, could it become more geographically dispersed? Yes, it could. And it could become a war between NATO and Russia. We, I mean, we, we're all trying to avoid that, and that is a red line which both sides have, uh, have uh, honoured at the moment. The Russians are very careful not to cross that red line, and we've been very careful not to cross it. But you can't say it would never be crossed. But so, so that part in, in particular, which I think a lot of people here would... would, would maybe you've got the better definitions, but mm. start calling it a world war at that yeah. point. It would feel like that uh, if both sides got more fully involved. I mean, of what you've said in the last 10 minutes... Yeah one aspect might lead to that, which is Russia going into full war footing. Yeah. I mean, how likely is that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd say it's, it's less than 50-50, because going on to a full war footing will be very, very serious. And I'm sure Putin will try to do all he can to avoid that in the next year. But if he ends up in a year's time with a situation that's worse than it is now for him, then, you know, you can't rule that out. And, yes, what we're talking about would be not World War III, but a general European war. That's the way we tend mm -hmm. to think of it, a general war in Europe. And, um, I mean, I never thought I would live long enough to see that prospect as a realistic prospect, but now I fear I'm going to live long enough to see that. Well, we hope it doesn't develop in that way, but we hope you live long enough to potentially uh, <laughs> to say experience I was wrong. <laughs> those sorts of uh, possibilities that don't quite materialise. Michael, great stuff. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. More questions uh, and answers with Michael uh, to come just the other side of this break. Don't go around. Well, this war has been going on for six months already, and and of course uh, Russia is is uh, threatening more, is is more aggressive than ever, uh, because they are clearly uh, not winning this war as they expected uh, to be a very short. Uh, short uh, uh, period of time when they achieve their goals. Uh, what is important uh, here is that we keep on isolating Russia and we keep on uh, pushing them so that they would go back to its borders and, and withdraw the aggression. We have to support Ukraine uh, every way we can uh, so that they can win this war, because if aggression pays off uh, somewhere it uh, serves as an invitation to use it elsewhere. What has happened is that uh, uh, when uh, Russia attacked uh, Georgia, uh, Crimea, uh, Donbas, then nothing happened uh, to them. Uh, I mean, they were not punished for the aggression. So uh, the message they got was that this pays off because uh, eventually they have more territories. And every time, with every uh, next step, they have been bolder. Well, uh, if you look at their um, their way of, uh, of operating, then they have been a attacking civilian, uh, uh, civilians. Uh, it is a war crime according to international law uh, when you target civilians. What we saw in Mariupol was a complete uh, destruction of the whole city and especially bombing hospitals, bombing uh, places where there were marks that they here are the children. Um, but um, so, so we shouldn't we shouldn't listen to what they are saying. It's an information operation, but uh, we should look at what they are doing. And what we see happening in Ukraine is uh, completely uh, vice versa. We are very grateful for Britain to uh, be our framework country. So uh, we have had very good cooperation uh, with Great Britain and, and the troops here present working together with our own defense forces have been a very good deterrent for, for Russia as well. Uh, that attacking us would also mean attacking UK or France or the other countries who are present here. Uh, therefore, we are very grateful. Welcome back as we continue our special question and answer programme on six months of the war in Ukraine. Our defence analyst Michael Clark has been answering your questions throughout this uh, hour. And uh, before we take more of those questions, uh, do remember to scan the QR code on the screen uh, and hear stories from those 
on Europe's new front line uh, on Sky News' Ukraine War Diaries podcast. Uh, do scan that QR code, subscribe to it, and uh, some of our other podcasts as well. All of them are available uh, for free wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, we'll leave that QR code on the screen for you for just a, a little moment longer. Michael, back to the Q&A. Peter Jackson asks, what are the red lines for each side uh, in a negotiated peace deal? And, and is a negotiated peace deal likely? That's one of the problems. Well, if we don't know what the red lines are, I mean, both sides make maximalist demands. So the Ukrainians say, we want to get all of our territory back, and they would say that because they're fighting for their lives. The Russians say that uh, they want to protect their people in the Donbass, but also they want to protect their people in the south, and they're going to annex parts of the south, and they've made it pretty clear that they don't regard Ukraine as a, as a proper state, and it deserves to be brought into Russia. So we don't really know what the red lines are. As I say, the red line that they've observed, which we've all observed, is that NATO and Russian forces should shall not come up against each other directly. Now, if that red line stays, we'll see. But at the moment, that's the thing that's stabilising it, as far as it is stabilised. My guess is that the basis... I mean, I think what Peter's talking about is that the basis for negotiation would be if the Russians agree to leave the territories that they've conquered since the 24th of February, that would, that, that would be the base of a, basis of a ceasefire, even if the two breakaway republics remained in being and Crimea remains where it is or as it is, and that that, would be a, that wouldn't be a peace deal, but it would be a ceasefire, and that might last for a few years before it broke down. So it Crimea would down. remain fully Russian, Luhansk and, and Donetsk. Donetsk would be sort of pseudo... I, yeah, I think they'd go back to a sort of Minsk III process. Min yeah. Minsk II was the peace deal that yeah. France, Germany and Russia and Ukraine put together. It was a lousy deal, to be honest. It was always a deal for the, the, for the two breakaway republics to get more and more independent and more and more linked to Russia. So going back to that might be the basis at least for a ceasefire, and a ceasefire might last for two or three years before it broke down. I mean, my, my view of this is that this is a generational struggle because Russia and Russian leaders, that, were, as far as we can see into the future, believe that Ukraine has no right to exist. So the Ukrainians are facing 50, 60, 70 years, two or three generations, in which they will be threatened by the neighbour that's ten times bigger than they are. Now, you can't fight a war that lasts 60 or 70 years in reality, so it'll be an on-off struggle, and that struggle has become an existential struggle about democracy in the West and autocracy and dictatorship in the East of Europe. And so that struggle will, will go in a series of, I think, wars. We're into the second war now. The first war was 2014, the second war is 2022. There might be a, a ceasefire in 2023, which lasts till, you know, 2027, 2028, and the third mm -hmm. war will be thereafter. That's, I think, is what we're probably looking at. And the, the red lines, the negotiating process, will change with each phase that it goes through. But we've got to be clear about this. We're looking at a fundamental uh, problem of European security, bigger than anything we've faced since, since 1939, which will go on for a couple of generations. I'm going to jump around here for, for the final six, seven minutes to make sure we get some of these questions in. So sanctions, uh, why are they not hurting Russia more? Or are they, but it's just not as, as, as well reported? Yeah. Because it feels to many Europeans like, like it's the other way around. Yeah, no, I mean, well, they're hurting us as well because sanctions do. That's the point. Everybody suffers in a way. But uh, the Russian economy is, underlying economy, is not doing at all well. Um, they are a cash-rich economy because of energy, because of gas and oil prices. That's all they've got. And if you look at other things, I mean, certain little indicators. So, you know, Western films, blockbuster movies are not available in Russia now. The cinemas can't show them. They don't have them. And so just Russian films are being shown. Mm -hmm. um, shop fronts are empty or they're being replaced now by Russian shop fronts, which haven't got very much stuff. Um, the Russian economy, the underlying economy, is in pretty poor shape, but they've got plenty of cash because of energy. So, and that's the, that's the safety valve for Putin and the Russian elite. But undoubtedly, sanctions, they were never going to stop this war, but sanctions punish Russia to the point where, in one year, two years, three years, they realise that unless there is some sort of ceasefire and some lifting of sanctions, their economy will just keep on going into a blind alley. Could China help Russia win this war? Uh, and if the West annoyed them enough on Taiwan, would that be a trigger? They could. Yeah, they could help. I mean, China's Putin's only hope, actually, of getting off the hook. But the Chinese are being very careful. They're, they're, they are supporting Putin. Xi Jinping himself is very close to Putin as a person. But Xi Jinping is not a very flexible man, and he's under quite a lot of pressure himself. Um, the Chinese 
I think, could... Uh, they're not breaking sanctions, by and large. They, they're giving some help, but nothing really dramatic. And they're very worried, the Chinese, about secondary sanctions, which Americans could put on them, of secondary sanctions, that is, if you deal with a company that deals with Russia, then you can be subject to secondary sanctions. And remember, the world is going into a global recession, and China's suffering more, than, more from that than most other countries. We think we're in a state... Just look at China. They're, they are going into a, a fairly deep recession, and they've got this crazy zero-Covid policy, which Xi Jinping runs, which which is making everything worse. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese are now very careful not to trip over sanctions policy by helping the Russians out too much. Two more questions, hopefully we can squeeze them. This one's from Crazy, but it's a, it's a great question, yep. despite, uh, despite the name. Western intelligence, we, we get these updates oh, yeah. on Twitter uh, from, from uh, the MOD. I mean, does that mean there's even more intelligence that they're not sharing? Oh, for sure. H how do oh, they yeah. decide what to release publicly? Has it already been shared for a month earlier, the, yeah. the Keysta? When people talk about sharing intelligence, what you're getting is a conclusion. No intelligence organisation shares real, raw intelligence, and they certainly don't ever share their sources, even with each other. I mean, the, the number one rule of intelligence is protect your sources. And that means you protect British sources from the Americans, American sources are protected from the British. We don't share our sources. But when you've actually put the raw intelligence together and you have a conclusion, then you may choose, for political reasons, to share that conclusion. By and large, it's better not to do that, but in certain situations it can be beneficial. But believe me, intelligence isn't being shared... The, the headlines are being shared, and, you know, the headline is like the tip of an iceberg. There's an awful lot of stuff underneath, which is very, very closely guarded. And very quickly, you said earlier that our overall forces are a bit depleted and we need to fix that. What about our intelligence services? Oh, are they with the best still or not? Yeah, they are, they're one of the jewels in our crown as far as security goes. With, with the Americans, we have the best intelligence feeds in the world, bar none. And British intelligence is still the one area of British security policy that everybody takes seriously. Everybody wants to be a part of it. And the Five Eyes Club, this America, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the five, the old Anglo-Saxon powers who share intelligence products, everybody wants to be in the Five Eyes. Everybody wants to join it, but nobody else can. Um, final question. You've got about 90 seconds to sum this up. For, who, who's winning six months in? Neither side is winning, um, but neither side is losing either. And that's a fairly Delphic idea. But um, if the Ukrainians can see out the winter, and if we in the West can see out the winter, and it's going to be a tough winter for us in all sorts of ways, and keep the Ukrainians in the war, then next year I believe that the pendulum will swing back towards Ukraine and Ukraine will put Russia under some pressure. Now, that's when it gets much more dangerous than it is now. And the, the Russians will be looking then not to be seen to lose and looking for a way out. And that's when it gets politically very, very interesting. But we've all got... I, I keep saying winter is coming. We've all got a tough winter to come. And, and just under a minute left, d does Boris Johnson departing number 10 make a difference? Or because both candidates, whoever will replace him, have a similar overall policy towards Ukraine, it, it should make a difference for yeah. the Yeah, I think we've got a national consensus on Ukraine. It's one of the very few things that all the parties agree on, apart from uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, and uh, all the public agree on, that we support Ukraine and we are, we're not, you know, we are appalled by what Russia has done. We're the most um, intransigent, in a way, or the most resolute anti-Russian country in Europe. We always were, and we're proving it again now. So it's one of the sort of, th it's the sort of thing that doesn't divide the parties in Britain, and I don't think it will in the future. Professor Michael Clark, always a pleasure. Thanks so much uh, for answering all those many questions, excellent questions from our viewers over the course uh, of uh, that last hour. Six months, of course, uh, into the war. Amazing uh, to think that 181 uh, days this war has been going on. Uh, still to come on, on Sky News uh, tonight, uh, lots more to come. In fact, we'll be speaking to a, a senior uh, Russian member uh, of uh, uh, Putin's advisory team, at least he's a senior uh, in the delegation uh, from Russia to the UN to get uh, their take on six months into the war. Uh, we'll also be live in Liverpool as police say people are coming forward with information on the killing of Olivia Pratt Corbell, but uh, need more information still. We'll be there next on Sky News tonight.